That's right. I have wrestled with an alligator. I don't tussle with a whale. I don't handcuff lightning, throw thunder in jail. You can't stop me. I'm going to win. It ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. I won't quit. I just keep getting stronger. 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 Hey everyone, welcome to Barbell Me Search. Um, we we got a special guest, but he wants to do a little intro, and I don't want to say your name wrong again. It's Kassem. 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 See, so you fucked it up. Bam. Well, sometimes I purposely do that because it's a good icebreaker because it's like, oh, they fuck up my name. But I was a teacher before, and I screwed up everyone's name, so that's my intro to this. But essentially, we're we're talking about the the deadlift and the squat and we want to kind of put some context to this before we get it, get into this, just kind of explain who our audience is and kind of what we do. So I'm Dean and one of my background essentially is in strength and conditioning, but the lens in which I think our audience and kind of what I want to hear is there's two camps in this industry in terms of if we look at strength and hypertrophy and there's like the, we got to do this low bar powerlifting thing. I'm an ex powerlifter. And then there's this whole other camp of position, and you can call it DNS, PRI, FRC, whatever, whatever three-letter acronym, where now we're in this field where there's a lot of this, I don't want to say new information, but a different way of looking at things, and they're layering it on hypertrophy, on bodybuilding, on powerlifting, and now people are butting heads. So I kind of wanted to get your perspective on things, and we'll kind of navigate this in a way where I think we can give both sides something to think about. And that, that at the very end of the day with this podcast, we want to bring people on that have original ideas, have original thoughts, and how did they come to conclusions? And then let the audience kind of figure out how do they want to use that. And yeah, Jeb, I don't know if you got anything to add. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually uh, started in this, this industry later in life, uh, long circuitous route I'll, I'll, I'll leave all that out but um i actually came into it probably more from uh i started training strongman i was like in my 30s decided i wanted to get bigger um and uh started off actually mostly coming through the kind of the publishing route started uh, writing fitness uh, uh content um was a personal trainer now i'm almost actually i'm solely a nutrition coach and i deal mostly in behavior I'm not a, a biomechanics expert by any means. Uh, Dean is definitely going to be the the uh, the the one that wears that pants in this this uh, interview. But I, I I have a rudimentary understanding, so um, you know, feel free to talk um, we you know, at, at Dean's level. At, at this time, after listening to your podcast with Ben, this is kind of how this all started. You're way above what I think. I, I, you won't admit it, I'm sure, but you're the way you think is like it's going to be way over. A lot of our a lot of our heads, I think, in terms of you could probably go into this thing for two hours. So we're we're doing this so that we can go into it to an hour into a very specific realm because I know you could go a lot of ways with this. Would that be a good way yeah. of doing it? Well, I guess the real test is is if I really know what I'm talking about, I should be able to give something relevant in an hour, right? Right. And you know, yeah. be able to go multiple hours. And you like Bane. So, There's Bane I, in the background. Bane yeah. is in the background. Yeah. So I yeah, think well, I got like Bane that. and and well, Venom Venom. right here. Look oh, at, like, look yeah, right. This. Arm wrestling. I got, but I got a oh, Venom tattoo go. right on me. So yeah. hopefully we're friends now. Um, but. So pop quiz. <laughs> After this hour, if you guys can tell me kind of like the significance of this like wrestling match between Arm and Bane, that'll determine how much I like you guys. Oh, All right. It's an anti-hero thing, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. Yes, it well, is. So, okay. I, I feel like, okay, I, I don't want to think about that because this is like, <laughs> I'm not going to listen to the podcast. Now. We, we, we can just go there. We can just talk about Spider Man. We can talk about Venom, Batman, and Green. And I think we could probably come to a conclusion about arm training and like break yeah. the backs. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you wanted to talk a little bit about low back. So, yeah. I mean, that fits in the context, right? Yeah, so I think where I want to direct this, at least at the beginning, is so in this camp of like people that we follow, um, it's moving towards this distinction between this hip dominant squat and this squatty squat, which would more simply be a, a more upright squat. Now, what you guys talked about with Ben is like, how do you get more quads? Where I think a lot of this position stuff is talking about how do I get it in a good stacked position with my thorax and pelvis aligned, the diaphragm. And do it in a way where I don't go into this hinge pattern, which would be a different strategy than the strategy of an upright squat. That being said, 
load becomes an issue in terms of now what are we looking for? So if we layer on this idea of hypertrophy, I'm not sure that going in either direction on the extremes is going to be helpful either way. That being said, I think that you're the expert on it, but you basically started this with the Instagram message saying, what the hell are you doing? And I think there's a better way. And so maybe we should start there. Yeah. So I think, you know, when, I, when I'm kind of looking from this, like I'm trying to look at the lens that you guys are in, because to be honest, like when I looked at PRI and, you know, posturology and all of this stuff, it was a couple of years ago. And I got to a certain point where it was like, okay, I'm comfortable that I, I can see where this would apply in context. So um, I think what will really help the average person is to just be a bit more clear on like, like, okay, what is a squatty squat, right? And it's like, okay, but what is the goal of a squatty squat? Is it upright? Because by definition, what goal does upright suit, right? And so I think when we look at these things, the most important thing is to just be more clear on what you want out of a movement. Because as soon as we throw squat on a movement, there comes a connotation. And so when you say, what's a squatty squat? And I'm like, well, who's squatty squat, mm -hmm. right? Like, be, because it's like, well, okay, like what defines squat E, right? Is it the amount of knee flexion? Is it the amount of hip flexion? Is it the shin parallel to the torso? Like what are, are, are these external goals? Are these internal loading goals? And then what is the, what is the adaptation that you're hoping to achieve from those things? So if we just break it down to, let's actually just figure out what are the principles that will allow me to accomplish certain goals in these movements through space, then I guess it doesn't really matter if you call it a squatty squat or a hippie squat, because there might be application of the extremes and in the middle for an individual with a gift given structure at a, for a given goal at a particular moment in time. Right. So my question for you would be what, like, where are you guys looking at it? What is the goal of a squatty squat? And what are you defining as like, what is a squatty squat? Well, this is where I'm trying to like work through it. So like, and like you said, you've taken all this stuff kind of beforehand. And, and the way I've been like picturing like these camps is that a squatty squats get more knee flexion and more or less squat in a way that keeps your pelvis and your rib cage stacked. So you can keep that diaphragm, um, I guess, not compensating. And then trying to avoid an extension strategy. But this is the fucked up thing. And this is where I like I would rather just see your take on it because with that, a lot of people aren't doing it. They're just going on a wedge, trying to with a front loaded weight, just doing the same squat that they were doing before. And so I think context is lost from the original thing, which is PRI, which is basically a pain management medical model that I don't know if you can layer that on. And so that's where it's just like the lens in which I'm looking at is, I don't know if it actually applies to the thing that they want, which is to not use an extension strategy in a squat. I don't know well, the best way, like you said, because it, there's so many individual variables that I think that it might just be negative. Like you said, with the low back stuff you were messaging me with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, what does PRI stand for again? Postural Restoration Institute. I don't wanna say well, that wrong. Well, yeah. what, was the first, what was the first two words again? Austral restoration. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Medical. So yeah. it's not it's not big squatty or big like yeah. stronger this. It's postural restoration, right? Yeah. And so th this is the example of like I don't think any of these three letter acronyms are bad because um, you know they all seem to bring tools. What I think happens is that when you get into a camp, in order for proof of concept, you have a measuring stick. And what happens is you start basing all of your decisions off of that one measuring stick, and then you lose context of the big picture. Yeah. So when we talk about everything that's going on in the trunk and the pressure and, you know, what are we expressing in terms of like all of this stuff with the pelvis, the nutations, and is that important? It's definitely a factor, right? Same thing as the local torque is a factor. The same thing is like all of these positional things. The reality is, if we're going to think about how does it apply to the goal, we have to understand how do we compare the measuring stick so that I know that like, okay, this is a thing it has a place, but does it like, is it high on the priority list or low on the priority list for this goal? So 
for instance, the squatty squat to be more upright and to be more knee dominant, right? Those aren't necessarily like they have to go together or mutually exclusive, right? Like you can, like some people can have tremendous knee like translation forward in a hingy type squat, right? They fold, but also they get, they have great ankle mobility and that suits their structure. In other people, it's the opposite. So when we're designing a squat, it's like, okay, what would I put in from an external perspective and from a technique perspective to achieve that goal? And then of course, like the conversation we had with uh, with Ben on like, well, is this you know good for quads? It's like, at the end of the day, am I actually, you know, should would my life have been easier just moving to a, yeah. a, you know, a different external environment, right? Just a different movement pattern. So, if we say that the squatty squat, right, is supposed to be a more knee dominant squat, we can say that well, okay, the goal is actually more quads. The question is, is the goal more quads and less glutes and adductor magnus, or is it just more quads? And I'll take whatever glute and adductor magnus that you can give me. Am I intentionally trying to deload the the trunk and the and the lumbar spine? Am I intentionally trying to deload the pelvis? And then when we talk about um, pelvic positioning, and I think this is uh, very important for people that maybe have done some of the postural stuff, is that when we think of this centering term, when you're just looking at it and like when we're looking at it, is the only force that's acting on us is gravity while we're still centering is the stacked position that's not the same when we apply external load or motion right and so that's i think when you would when we start moving into environments where there's a huge external load or a huge physics you know impact on our body because we're sprinting or whatever centering is when is relationship to all of those forces right and so you, if we take this like, well, all oh, the pelvis always has to be right under the skull for this particular expression or something. I'm like, well, you're thinking about that when we're looking at the only force is this gravity through the body. But what all of a sudden happens when my all of these muscles on my skeletal system start changing the forces on my body, right? That's that's now a more asymmetrical force than this kind of linear thing. And I'm, when I say asymmetrical, I'm not quite getting into like the, you know, Pat Davidson expansion of the universe asymmetrical, just like we're going to have, you know, we're going to have some sort of horizontal vectors that we're now going to have to start, um, you know, taking well, into consideration when we define. Go ahead. I was going to say, it's good you mentioned Pat, because like my thoughts on it are like kind of very similar to yours. Is like, I think we can, there's like, <laughs> There's a middle ground here and everyone's going to extremes. But with Pat's stuff, I don't even think Pat is on the extreme. I think his stuff gets layered on into things that they're already doing. And then it, it defeats the purpose of kind of what he was going for, which was to kind of have a shape shifter, so to speak, in terms of their rib cage, blah, blah, blah. And you can apply this thing to then, I guess, fix that thing and maybe come to a different conclusion. But no one got to that point. They're just like, all they heard was wedges and squatty squats. And now everything is just that which again yeah. has no context to it and could be a negative. Like, and that's what you essentially said when we had this conversation, like there could be a negative to this stuff if the goal is this thing. Yeah. So for instance, if we, if we look at, uh, if we look at our goal is to load the quads more. So we're trying to make a more knee dominant squat, quad dominant squat whatsoever. We, that means we want to be able to produce as much torque and as much tension around that knee joint through the quadriceps and that doesn't work in isolation so you know i think sometimes you know you have people that look at it like there's uh you know there's things that i've been through where people look at torque and isolation like they look at this joint and they do all the calculations and they're looking at the external load and all the stuff that's there and then there's other people that are looking at this whole integrated system and the reality is well it's a combination of both right so if you're just using one measuring stick or the other you're almost always going to be you know, partly wrong, at least. So if we're saying, okay, I want to make this super quad dominant, is there a point where if I'm sitting too upright, that I actually start to lose the ability to create more torque at the knee, I just decrease my system's tolerance to load so much that my knee could be eight feet in front of me. And it doesn't matter because I just like from a stability perspective and from a balance and coordination perspective, I don't have the ability to produce that torque at this point. I've, I've created an environment where even though mechanically, yes, 
it's very biased, it, the sum of work that I'm able to do at that joint has actually decreased. And that will happen if we, if we essentially go to like something stacked over the pelvis completely, we lose the counter forces in the pelvis. So think of it this way. If you're shifted forward a little bit, there's a little bit of tension in the glutes and there's a little bit more tension uh, in the adductor magnus and the hamstrings are able to work that co-contraction with the, you know, rectus femoris on the other side. And so I'm able to use that slight bit of torque at the hip by you leaning forward as a source of stability. And that is going to, that is really going to help. So like a way that I think of it is, is like, like imagine that I was going to throw this foam. Okay. If I was to be like straight underneath it and try and throw it horizontally, it would just collapse like that. But if I was to try and throw it from a, like a vector like this, I'd be able to chuck it across the room. Right. You know, but I won't put this. In my I was going to be like, you should um, definitely throw that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Let's send people right the video. Um, <laughs> totally worth it to, for the explanation right yeah. so that's what happens sometimes when we get more vertical is we essentially get to the point where it's like okay my nervous system and everything that's going into this is going to essentially result in less overall output at that joint even though from a ratio perspective we really biased it mm -hmm. so there's a point of diminishing returns for how upright you get because our but like you know if, if you look at this as like an integrated system, which most of the people that are coming from like a PRI background or something, they're looking at as an integrated system. It's, it would be the equivalent of like, you just, you know, creating it like deflating one end of the system. And it's like, okay, now everything that's over here is insignificant. So if you look at it from like the, you know, the pressure, the, uh, the compression uh, expansion mindset, it's like, well, if you get so far upright, do I actually lose the ability for all of these muscles to contribute to that compression and expansion uh, pattern. And it's essentially what I see when people do these squats that are essentially, you're just, your torso is floating through space. You can only produce so much. So when I looked at the squat that you showed, mm -hmm. right, which was this very, very upright squat, you know, that's why I was like, well, what's the goal of this? Because the only thing that you can accomplish by being that upright that you could argue would be beneficial is you are forcing yourself to not really use any load. Yeah. Right. Like, and that's kind of, and it, I kind of got to that point. I'm like, yeah, the people we're dealing with is gen pop is like a lot of the times they end up using, it almost keeps them in the safe zone and they still feel more leg. They feel more of the things without mm -hmm. having to feel all the other stuff. And generally what tends to happen, and we're looking at a model where there's, this is totally not what I do personally, but when we have lots of people and there's, we have no coaching because it's a mass system, I'm trying to control mm -hmm. variables in the sense that they can almost do no harm by just going hard at the thing. And then load ends up being the thing that they can't do because we can't get, they can't do that thing and put too much load. And then it keeps them, I guess it keeps them pulled back um, because of the system we're using. We're not dealing with strength athletes. We're dealing with people who like come from beach body to then want to do yeah. some strength training. But that's an understanding of that thing, which I think, like you were saying gets layered on top of literally everything and I'm kind of trying to figure out that like when you talked about that I was like it made me think because I don't think people are thinking about the reason why they're doing it they're doing it because Pat said to do it you know what I mean as opposed to thinking critically on how can you use it because I think that you can use it if load's an issue for me knee pain is an issue what did it end up doing I'm not using the same amount of load like that's but I don't think you ever get there Contextually, yeah. I know in my programming, it's put in there because I have a history of low back problems and it's actually forces me into uh, getting abs. Like it's not about a load thing. It's, it's more because um, I'm going to go ham on, on leg press for quads. <laughs> you know, it's like, it just doesn't seem to make sense. Um, but, but that's actually been beneficial in, in helping me create some uh, stability in my trunk by putting that forward load and getting that kind of upright positioning that's pulling me down but you use leg press which i kind of you got to that point. well and yeah but I, but i my old training i stopped squatting altogether because my back hurt so all i did was hack squats and leg press and my legs actually got bigger when squatting they never did what does so. body squat mm -hmm. fix all of that is kind of and that's where it kind of becomes this like holy thing where it's like this fixes everything and like i don't and you're basically yeah, like, yeah it doesn't <laughs> well you have to look at everything that's going on, right? Because if you say like, okay, well, this squatty squat is basically 
it's eliminating us loading certain things. And was that the best way to do it? Or are we just saying, wow, this is good because we happen to get this other thing, but is there a, is there a better way? So for instance, if you get back pain from squats, right? Shouldn't that tell you that there's something that should be addressed? Because should mm -hmm. we get back pain from squats? No. We should be. I mean, you should be able to squat without back mm -hmm. pain. So anytime where I'm looking at that, the question is, well, but why are you getting back pain, right? So it, if, if your goal is hypertrophy, we could say like, well, okay, squat was not the most efficient way towards that goal anyway. But if you're trying to figure out within your system what is awry, um, if, if I just switched to something that essentially just removed the expression of that problem, I didn't necessarily fix the problem. Because the question would be, after doing squatty squats, can you go back and do heavy squats with no back pain anymore? That would be a better assessment rather than, okay, I started doing squatty squats and now my back doesn't hurt anymore. Because right. guess what? If you just did no squats, you might also just <laughs> yeah yeah you're right well, like, point. Yeah, like i right? think that like you know? that, i would rather you say that because like i think that i don't i just don't want people to be dogmatic about things like mm -hmm. I, I get that like if you do those things that's cool it's just like have a reason for it and then understand that like yeah you could have just stopped doing squats and it might have done the same thing i, I guarantee like for me that might have been but it's that whole idea of i think there's a lot of people listening to this that are practicing this stuff and they're kind of going through that process of learning about it and then how do i apply it when I think if I bring someone on like you, you can say, you can also try these things and apply those and maybe come to an easier solution. Maybe not, but maybe. Yeah. You know, and this is where, like, if you're a trainer or a coach or even an individual, you have to always look at, you need a, you need a solution. Like right now, you need maybe a, an intermediate, a long-term solution, some, some combination of those. Because like, if somebody comes in, it's like, my back hurts when I squat but I'm a trainer, I'm a coach. My goal is still to provide them a training stimulus. So that means the immediate solution might be, we go do this other exercise. That does not mean that I've, you know, I've in any way helped with whatever problem they were having with the squat. It's just that I found a way to deliver a positive and avoid, uh, you know, a negative, you know, with it within that session. Um, and I think, uh, I think, you know, like you were said, we need to put context in this stuff and not misapply it or, or, you know, look at it through a bigger lens so that we understand what are we actually accomplishing with these changes or these interventions. And my, my process is always going to be, look, if we found a weak link in the chain, just because we worked around it, you know, it, this, and, you know, we'll probably find that weak chain again later. It'll come up somewhere else. It'll come up in the deadlifts. It'll come up in the RDL. It'll come up in line uh, leg curls. It'll come up when they're, you know, moving house or, you know, who knows, right? Um, so in the back of my mind, anytime something gets exposed, I also want to think, okay, can we address this? You know, maybe that's in my wheelhouse. Maybe it's outside of my lane. Doesn't really matter. The whole point is if somebody came in, they're like, when I do this, it hurts. And that was actually like, it was a biomechanically proficient activity. It wasn't just like, oh yeah, I was just putting you in a terrible position. You no, know, it would be weird if it didn't hurt. If it was like, if this was a sound thing and then you were in pain, it's like, okay, I know that your system could be optimized. We may be able to do other things where you can perform asymptomatically. That doesn't mean that you've quite been optimized. So if you're working with a population um, and you're worried about like, okay, I don't want to put a lot of low back uh, stress on them because they have low back pain. Is that, so, is that the solution? Or in reality, it's like, do they actually maybe need to strengthen more of the components out there? I just need to find a, a more appropriate way to put resistance through that tissue and, and those motions, right? It's just not, it's not a squat right now because a squat is a big, you mm -hmm. know, coordinated movement where I'm slaves to, to, to a lot of levers, but what if I could actually just figure out, all right, you have pain here, okay? We can avoid pain, but then we can also bring up strengths that will make it so like, okay, you have the ability to go back to these activities and then maybe actually do them in a position without pain.
right? And then, you know, we can get into the whole psychological. You well, know, maybe we go, we, maybe we do go there because I think like this is super pertinent to me. But, <laughs> but in terms of like, I don't like say fixing a squat, but let's say you, you, you let's use the expansion compression model. You, you have all these people riding high in extension and super compressed, and then eventually they break. And then now what I find, and, and this is personally to me, but I think a lot of people are, are starting to add in the other end of the spectrum. And for anyone listening, we're doing it on videos, so there's like a spectrum, but that's where we have the squatty squats. What would be your way to bring them back to a point where they can do this without going full, uh, I'm not going to use, without going full PRI or full into this one area, but still being able to get a stimulus, but then being able to do the thing in which they want to do later. Yeah, this is where it gets hard to keep this in an hour because know. if we have, if we have an in, if, <laughs> if, if, a big one, <laughs> right? So, I mean, we can give a, we can give an example and kind of walk through that. Right. But there's no way that we can cover every possible thing. I think that's important that like, if, if we give an example, people don't automatically assume that you, that is you. And that's what we tend to do. Cause if, as soon as we relate to one point of an argument, we assume to just, you know, Everyone take does. the whole rest of it to ourselves. Um, you know, cause you could have somebody where, all right, as like, to be honest, the majority of the problems I see with people squat just actually comes down to technique and load. Mm -hmm. Meaning that if they use proper technique and proper load, all of a sudden it becomes a non painful movement. And there are definitely people, especially if you've done powerlifting or whatnot, where you have to do so much training where your technique is restricted to the, the sports, not your body, right? Where that's, that has caused you to develop, you know, some maybe structural imbalances or, you know, some, you know, poor motor patterns, et cetera. And just, you've just, just beat up your body um, by forcing it into places it simply doesn't fit. And sometimes the just stepping away from that and then training in a biomechanically favorable way allows the system to kind of recover and then have a greater tolerance to being pushed yeah. into those, you know, forced positions like if you're a power lifter you that you that's a fact of your sport and that's always the extreme of this conversation is just like well okay a power lifter has to hit certain metrics in a squat but no other goal has to squat a certain way right so they can do a hingey squat they can do a knee dominant squat they can do no squats, you know, it really, really doesn't matter. So really, you know, when I'm looking at, okay, what does it take to fix a person? I'm trying to figure out, you know, what's the cause? Is there a weak leak in the chain? And to be honest, most of the time, it is simply like either a misappropriation of technique or load or a combination of both. So let's look at like a few examples. So like one is the knee valgus, right? That's a super common thing when people people squat there you know we get the knees cave in and then there's the whole like well why do the knees cave in you know we could, we could tell that story from so many directions and the reality is it's like well they're all parts of the chain so they're they all could or couldn't be true to varying degrees right um so you could be like well, one person might say like well that's the weak vmo theory right and everybody hates that one now right when in reality technically you know, if you were able to produce more torque at the knee at the bottom, that is going to shift you a little bit. So are there instances where simply weakness in the quads in relationship to the hips is going to affect how much of the adductor magnus is going to have to work? Absolutely. But it's not always the case, right? How about lack of dorsiflexion, right? What happens when we reach our end? I mean, the natural end range of dorsiflexion is with, you know, kind of a pronation so that, you know, that's going to cause that tibial rotation and the need to come in. Um, how about weak glutes, right? At hip extension, if my glutes aren't able to work as much as they should, the adductor magnus has to do a higher percentage of that load. It's going to pull the knee in, right? How about if I simply just have a, um, a stance where I start to get impinged and my pelvis has to start to tuck, right? You know, my, my nutations are off, my, uh, my anterior posterior tilts, like I'm starting to get forced into that butt wink position. And you'll almost always see valgus with butt wink because when all of a sudden the pelvis has to come down, what does that mean? Well, the glutes have to allow that, which means, you know, the hamstrings and the adductor magnus then have to apply a little bit more load. So 
there's a million ways to look at these stories and figure out why. Um, so the question is, how do you look at somebody and determine that? And some of the simple things are just eliminate the really easy ones, right? Like, okay, if somebody's knees are caving in, is it because their stance is too narrow? Is it because they lack dorsiflexion? Because if I can give somebody just a simple external change and all of a sudden the internal problem is gone, that means it's like, okay, I, I just didn't set them up right. Yeah. Right. So it's like, okay. And you'll have people that have been squatting for years in a, in a pattern that doesn't necessarily fit them just because they didn't know any better. Um, and they happen to be proficient in terms of how much load they could move in that pattern. And they just stayed there. And a lot of times the more trained somebody is, the more tempted they are to do that because anytime you change the external environment, there's a small learning curve, right? Like if I switch somebody to technically what's a biomechanically more favorable squat to them, day one, it may not be as strong as their other squat because they might've had a bunch of compensatory patterns to use a lot of passive tissues and whatnot in their other squat or because that's the way they've been squatting. Like maybe, you know, you got a big old butt and really tiny quads because as soon as you started squatting that way your body was going to kept you know kept going towards the strength and that kept getting stronger and the other one. so there's so I, many i have literally yeah. no i literally have no legs i should stand up like i have ass and i have a massive giant erectors giant erectors and no quads and like i i, I squatted like 650 fuck you man he said i squatted like 500 but like I, I look like I can't squat. So anyway, it's funny because you're talking to me. So yeah, but, you got short femurs too. Yeah, I have long femurs. Do you? You okay. long? Like I should stand up. You want me to take my pants off? <laughs> every squatter, every squatter says they have long femurs, right? And then I look at them and I'm like, yeah, okay, long long femurs compared to good squatters, maybe. But long femurs compared to really long femurs? Yeah, I don't have long femurs then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah. You're 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 comparing yourself to other other powerlifters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. But so it, it's funny that, you, and this is where, like, I know we're kind of going off track, but I think that this is actually going to be helpful because basically all the stuff that you described, you're like talking about pronate, like this might fix pronation, knee valgus, hips coming under. What I see and what I see like doing on the gram all the time, but like when people are preaching all this stuff, that's, they're saying the squatty squat's going to do that. Like it's going to get pronation, it's going to get the pelvis, it's going to whatever, stack everything and, and do all those things. And they're thinking it's a magical fix. But what I hear you saying is why don't you just pick apart the thing that's doing it and then give a different prescription other than saying that this one thing's magic, because I don't think it ends up being that, especially when it's not done perfectly. And this was my argument to Ben is that let's just talk squatty squat, whatever, like all the fucking full PRI bullshit. That's a coaching nightmare. Like it's a coaching nightmare to get people to feel those things. So I don't even know if it's a good tool because it's so heavily indoctrinated in the system that you need to feel your duct or your ham. It's like so sensory that I think it's so a coaching nightmare. Well, here's, here's, here's my thing with the sensory stuff, right? Is, um, is I think this, like in terms of sensation, there's a lot of reasons that we feel something, okay? Um, and it's not always a good thing. And it's a very poor measure of tension, right? And, you know, so this is the simple test that I usually do with people is just like, okay, if you take an arm at like 90 degrees of elbow flexion and you just use your other arm and you squeeze into it, right, as hard as you can, there's no doubt that you're creating tension through the biceps there, okay? And you can feel that. Right. But even even if you're squeezing as hard as you can there's not that much sensation there compared to other things that you get right and so it's like sensation is not necessarily you know correlated to well how many motor units am i contracting how much tension is there in this muscle um and so a lot of times you know if we're trying to get people to feel what would they end up doing is they just end up co-contracting around a joint so if you compare how this feels versus if you just hold your arm by itself and then try and squeeze both sides, most people will actually feel more the co-contraction, contracting against no resistance other than you're fighting your own internal like resistance, like biceps and triceps co-contracting. So that's a totally like you wouldn't you wouldn't try and get big that way. Like, well, I guess we don't need to squat now. Everybody just sit here and I feel more like just yeah. get yeah, right. Um, so 
sensory based training, especially in beginners, is to me essentially it's it's just the absolute wrong direction to go because you're just asking way too much of that person to be able to say, okay, I want you to feel this, but I need you to feel it in a way that, that like correlates to this good amount of muscular tension and not this co-contraction or the fact that the joint is getting, you know, jammed or the fact that you're just in an unstable position because all of those things heighten sensation, which means like if you look at um, kind of the way that uh, like the whole popularity of mind muscle connection has taken the industry is it's popularized a lot of exercises that are just based off of like, while well, these provide a tremendous sensation to the body. And I would say more of them than not are actually really crappy exercises. And that's why we, that's why we're getting so much sensation. Like if we, if we look at the way the nervous system works, our sensory system is designed to let us know when things aren't going so well. Yeah. Like, it would it would be really annoying if we constantly were just getting feedback like all good, all good, all good. All, like <laughs> your brain would be like completely overwhelmed at the time. You're like, God, could something go wrong so I get a break? But no, instead, it's a hundred percent the other way. Is we try and get as little of that sensory stimulus other than what's needed, right? So I mean, there's a you know, you could look at that from an energy system, you know, perspective. That's just, that's the way that we, we've evolved. It's like, okay, we only want to be able to focus on the most important things, right? And that's, from a sensory perspective, that's huge. That's a whole, like, well, if your left foot hurts, step on your right. And then all of a sudden, your left foot doesn't <laughs> hurt anymore. And it's not because you fixed it. It's just because your brain is focusing on the most important thing that's like, hey, this is shit over here this is broken or you know whatever stop doing whatever is causing that um and so the same thing applies to these you know the sensation based training is we are subject to all of those rules so in reality i like to use my expertise to guide the beginner and depend on them the least amount as possible meaning that i need to make the external environment as good of a coaching cue as possible so it's like, okay, the direction of the resistance that I'm putting on them, that's the main director. That's like giving their body the neurological and physics problem that it needs to solve. The better I am at giving them the appropriate problem to solve unconsciously, the less work they have to do consciously. So if I set somebody up with a load or in a position that doesn't suit their body, especially a beginner, they're just like all of the sensory feedback that they get, they don't know what's good and, and, and what's bad or how to interpret, uh, you know, whether they're being productive or, or not at that point in time. Um, you know, and when we talk about exercise, there tends to be a co positive correlation with pain or, you know, like oh, pain is bad, but when we go in the gym, people think, oh no, it's supposed <laughs> to hurt. So therefore now, oh, how'd that feel? Oh, it felt great. When in reality, it felt like shit, but because now we're in the gym environment, they think, well, that, that bad is now good. You know, yeah. no now means yes kind of so, thought process. So, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of double back a little bit because um, it was a little bit unexpected twist there is that because I kind of think of you as like a, a really hypertrophy guy. Like I think of like, like really science-based bodybuilding um, and then to kind of pivot off that, that like, uh, kind of going away from that mind muscle connection, which to me is like such a, uh, a, a bodybuilding staple. What, what kind of exercises would you classify as like those mind muscle connection exercises that actually suck? Not all of them. Cause then it's Not all. just, just, right. just one or two. It's just like the one <laughs> that are like, like your pet peeve and the bro is listening to this and be like, fuck you. And you're gonna be like, no, yeah. like, this is why you're wrong. Yeah. Well, the, the, um, the, the, the commonality in a lot of the ones that suck tend to be ones that take a joint to an inappropriate extreme range. And then you essentially are applying like a posing intent or whatever. So like, um, for instance, like the, the biceps is always an easy one to go through because it's just very simple for people. Like, so if you want a lot of sensation in the biceps, you can co-contract. But the other thing you can do is you can like drive it intentionally into like a super short position mm -hmm. and then start to contract it there, right? Now, there is a shortening to the biceps here. 
right? But it doesn't mean that, that like shortened is better because what a lot of people will do is, is like, well, okay, if it's a shoulder flexor, then I'm just going to flex my shoulder like until it's like until I'm wiping my butt from an overhead position. And then I'm going to try and contract my bicep there. And yeah, you're going to get a lot of sensation in there because you've destabilized the joint at the shoulder, the muscles getting to passive insufficiency. Um, and so that's the pattern that I tend to see. The other thing is, is when we, um, like in the upper body is uh, a lot of the stuff where you restrict the scapular motion mm, and yeah. then you try and make the humerus go somewhere because technically you're, you're now you're, you're starting that co-contraction process and you're intentionally destabilizing the joint because the scapula is basically its whole job is to move to keep the glenoral humeral joint in the best possible mechanical advantage position against whatever load you happen to be overcoming. So the second we start reducing that, all of a sudden, no matter what we're doing, we're going to a suboptimal uh, position at that point in time. You know, we'll, we'll, th th that needs to be in context because somebody could have a bad motor pattern that you're trying to correct. But in general, you need to, if the humerus is moving, that thing needs to move. The second that you restrict that, all of a sudden you will see like, oh, wow, now if I do this pull across the body thing, but I'm also pulling back while pulling doing this, it's the, it's the bicep and tricep thing again. It's like, well, I'm creating this co-contraction. It's going to give me a lot of feel. But now if we actually measure like, well, if we're doing that, how much force can you produce here, right? And if I put a bunch of EMG sensors on it, why does it look like now like a Christmas tree instead of an arrow targeted at the tissue that I wanted to train? And it's because you're, you're creating all of this unnecessary contraction. It actually limits your force production. And just getting down the rabbit hole even more because I know that's what you guys want me to do. Is make this <laughs> we don't bring you on. We do, this it's, is a pony show. Yeah. We need you to go deep. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's the one thing that everybody's agreeing on in her pursuit right now? The main mechanism oh, of all of them is mechanical tension, tension right? right? And in order to have like stimulatory mechanical tension, like from a pursuit perspective, we have to have external load because if we're co-contracting, right? We're essentially managing the resistance to always not be that demanding. And there's no eccentric component. There's no stretching of the muscle. Like all of the things that we consider are going to be the main drivers of mechanical tension are gone and you're just expending a lot of energy, right? You know, so any of those exercises where you're adding a co-contraction in addition to whatever resistance, what it does is it's you're decreasing the resistance that would be stimulatory to mechanical tension in exchange for a co-contraction that's just making you tired. This, this is good because I think this actually layers onto the squat talk. So actually, if the, mm -hmm. so if we go like squatty squat uh, and we, we talk about less tension and these co-contractions and these feelings, you're saying that that's like, again, not help. Like I'm thinking about someone moving away from the powerlifting squat to try to change their squat a little bit to do more load, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. What's a better way then? Because basically we're saying that like the, the squatty squat with like very low load and trying to like, do their fucking straight thing is like the equivalent of them bicep curling fucking behind their head, like the dude swinging on the short position. So maybe we're not getting that far, but is what's a better way to kind of achieve that goal that a lot of these strength coaches are looking at trying to do in this? Yeah. So if I'm trying to put more load in the quad, that's what I should be using. That should be my measuring stick, right? Because that's, that's the goal. So what I need to do is I need to use the measuring stick that applies to my, to that, right? And how much load is on the quad is going to be a factor of, you know, how far the knee is translating forward and also a factor of how much load I'm carrying, right? So it, if I'm putting the knee really far forward, but I'm using very little load, you know, is that actually more load at the, you know, in terms of tension that the quad has to produce than if I were to be using a little bit more load with maybe a little less translation? Um, or can I get maximum translation and then find the amount of hinge that allows me to tolerate the most load with maximal knee translation? And that's where I'm going for when I'm doing a quad dominant squat. So it's like, all right, let's create the environment that is going to allow us to get maximal knee translation, right? And then let's put the rest of the body in a position to be able to help me put the most load onto that, right? And so that's why like in the, the podcast that I did with Ben, the solution was let's use a high bar back squat because we'll be more upright than a low bar, 
right? The low bar just is, you know, is just a way to make it closer to the hip. Um, and let's use a wedge and let's orientate that in a way that is going to allow me maximal knee translation with minimal change of mechanics at the ankle. So it's like, I don't want to create a weakness anywhere in the chain. I want to make sure that everything else does like every other muscle and every other joints ability should be like, I want them to be on easy street so that the thing that I'm trying to work has to be the thing that is like, I'm going to reach failure there. I'm going to reach failure at knee extension. I'm going to reach failure because the quads have just done everything that they could. Um, now, when we put this in the context of a goal, understand that with a squat, because my body doesn't want to fail, is you do have to fight the like the the desire to want to change your mechanics away from a muscle that is fatiguing. Mm-hmm. And that's where I see this. At, so this is where it's kind of cool. And like, I, it's not the same conversation as Ben's, but it kind of ends up being it. But so you looked at, I think you guys talked about like, you could layer on a compensation upon a compensation upon a compensation. But if you're looking to like pull out something to fix one of those, you could then create a different exercise or squat to then attack that goal. So like with yours, it was like, let's attack the quad. For some people, maybe it is attacking the hamstring. Maybe for some people, it's attacking their ability to, I guess, round over on thoracic. And you could kind of create an environment using biomechanics but a brain and a different exercise to then attack that goal it just has to be more specific than let's just go squatty squat and do no load because you're saying that that's you're just going to feel more stuff like I can totally agree with that because I used to do like isometrics trying to just kind of feel it out and my quads felt like they were on fire but it's that same bicep thing it's the exact same oh the, the extreme stretching because I've done uh uh the uh, dog crap stuff and the extreme stretching that's the worst pain of anything and there's no load right? Because you're so totally shortened. Yeah, that's a, um, that's a neurological thing though. When we talk about getting into extreme stretching, we won't go down there, but that's just, there's <laughs> something about taking a muscle to a full stretch, um, you know, where there, there's definitely a different sensory thing that goes there. So that's the other p- place that people tend to feel a muscle. They feel it either when it's fully shortened and like there's more, you know, just more pressure within the, within the muscle or they feel the stretch, which also is more, uh, pressure within the muscle but like that's so that's also a really good place to teach people in terms of cues sometimes is from those two positions because if you are going to use a sensory base it's nice to be able to try and say like okay I'm going to guide you from a position where you're more proprioceptively aware of this tissue um, anyway let's let's do this so then. wait I, actually okay. I wanted to kind of tie one thing in because this kind of comes back to our other our other talk and kind of in the idea of range of motion. So what I wanted to question, and this is obviously a more general question, but so if we're talking about knee translation as being kind of the, the, um, the dominant factor for quad loading, therefore, if we get to the point of, of maximal knee, um, knee translation, wherever we're at in our squat range of motion, anything further than that, are we just, yeah. So, and what you, this, like, when we're looking at knee mechanics, you know, when we talk about like, okay, you know, a full squat or, you know, a full knee flexion is hamstring and calf, but there is a, there's a difference between like the hamstring and the calf, you know, kind of, you know, touching each other versus really compressing all of that soft tissue, right? Which now creates a whole different force on not only the knee joint, but actually gives you a passive amount of force to reverse that position so you you know if you think of it this way like you know if you were to um if you wanted to load the pecs okay if you were to like lower something down to where the pecs are stretched and then you had to push up from that stretch okay you're working the pecs in and out of that stretch position but if i were to put a block or something on there so that like as i come down now i'm kind of like all right now there's something even if it was a squishy pad you know or whatever right not a full block it's like okay that is starting to actually be a factor in there right so you get that in terms of like okay if i start just letting myself like sink into the bottom of a squat just kind of like fall into it i start building up that pressure and in the knee it's actually a prying pressure so like like it's starting to it's like it's basically creating almost like a like a pry bar to separate the knee joint itself um so excuse me i like to kind of define that position of like we're touching 
capped a hamstring, but we're not going to start taking load off the quad by allowing the passive tissues to start forming, you know, kind of a pressure spring in there. Uh, and that's also going to be better for, for the knee joint. So even in hip dominant squats, because in a hip dominant squat, people's butt starts to like swing forward. If they do like full acid grass squats, they do that thing to the knee. Right. And so that's how somebody can get knee pain in a squat <laughs> oh, that's yeah. mechanically loaded more at the hip. Right. Yeah. It's because they're transferring that 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 force from the pressure. And so, there's, I mean, again, that's one example of a, of a million stories that we could tell. Um, but so you just have to approach every muscle or, you know, movement with the same goal of figuring out, OK, what do I need to accomplish from a lengthening, shortening, et cetera? to get the most stimulus and how do I make sure the joint isn't compromised while I do that. So the load on the quad is a product of how far away the knee is from your center of mass and how much load is coming down. If you increase either of those and the other one stays the same, it goes up. If you increase both of them, it goes up a lot uh, faster, right? And that's why like when you switch to a knee dominant squat, it feels a lot heavier on you know than a, than a hip dominant squat did because it's like well the same load if you translate the knee twice as far forward it's the equivalent of putting twice as much weight uh on your back in terms of how your quads are dealing with it right and so maybe this is where we go, go i think we, we got like let's try to like isolate something that i think will be helpful for people so we, you talked about the the hinge squat and then like oh they swing down they get knee pain like i think every powerlifter can fucking say that but at the same time if we're looking squat squat like they're not gonna get as much load how can people that have exposure to th these types of things find the 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 biomechanically sound thing that's going to give them the most tension in all the muscles without I guess I want to say, I hate using compensation, but without using a strategy that's not going to allow them to train longer. Because what I'm thinking is, is if we have these compensations at the end or like those, like the buckling in the knees and all those things, because they're trying to do this thing, they end up at the, the end goal, they can't train as long. So how does someone go around finding that place for them, for their body type? And I know we don't need to go over all body types, but if they were troubleshooting, how do they kind of go about adding those things in to get that goal, so to speak? Yeah, well, I mean, essentially what you have to do is if you figure out what what the elements of this movement are needed to accomplish that. So in this case, it's knees forward, weight on the bar, mm -hmm. right? Those are the two things that I'm trying to to increase. If whatever I'm doing isn't contributing to either of those two things, right, then it doesn't need to be a factor. Or maybe it need, even needs to be limited, right? So if you start coming upright and you notice you have to take weight off the bar, but the knees aren't going forward, right? It's like, okay, then likely I'm going in the wrong direction now. I'm decreasing the work there. So you have to look at like, what's that point of diminishing return? So as soon as something is all of a sudden decreasing the amount of, you know, force you're able to put through that tissue, then it's like, okay, well, what have I added? That's I've created a new weak link in the chain somewhere that isn't my desired goal. So the same thing for a hip dominant squat. I could be like, okay, what's the goal of a hip dominant squat? If it's to load the hip musculature, all right, it's butt back and weight on the bar, right? If all of a sudden I'm doing something that's limiting my ability to get my butt back and fold or limiting the weight on the bar, then all of a sudden it's like, okay, I need to evaluate. Was, was, that, was that an important thing? Um, you know, probably not if it wasn't attributing to the goal. Um, and you know, if you don't know anything about my biomechanics and technique, first off, just go learn that stuff. It's your, your, you should know how your body moves. Um, you're going to be in it for your entire life. Um, Good sales pitch. but yeah. Um, but you should always kind of look at that with everything that you do in training is that if something is limiting my performance or my output, towards whatever muscular or movement based goal I have, I need to, I need to seriously evaluate, okay, was, was, was that a good, like, did this come with a benefit that was worth the reduction in performance, right? So if I'm going to teach somebody a movement, I'll, I'll have to decrease load maybe to help them relearn a movement pattern. Um, but there's a positive to that. Like I'm taking away load so that we can now prioritize this other thing. So that's the only instance where we should see a big drop in performance is when something else becomes the priority other than putting tension through that tissue. 
Well, and this actually, so th that was my, so you, you just did a way more elegant way of describing what I was trying to do. I was trying to get on knee pain, but like, I was like super wide. Like I should have actually brought the screen share. I, I sent it to Ben, but it was like wide stance, heel, knee wrap, <laughs> fucking full boom. Six just trips, hideous. But, but like total pain. So I went to the opposite of the inspection to build that thing. But have you found in your experience that someone can change how they do something over time by having those interventions? Cause like I, my thought process is I, I might just squat the way I squat for max load, no matter what in those moments, it's just going to fucking happen. But can you kind of nudge people to intuitively or like unconsciously change how they do something just through building up muscles or building up those capacities elsewhere? Like, have you seen that? Yeah. And you know, you may have to periodize how you take your approach. So if we, if we look at your ability to do a, a squat that's quad dominant, right? Part of it is going to be, okay, what well, you set up, your anthropomorphics, whatever. But also your strength and your current motor patterns, meaning that right now, if your quads are weak and your butt is strong, that's a factor in how you have to shift your body under load. So the only way to not do that is going to be, well, one, you're going to have to like mentally be conscious of the technique. Yeah. But two, we're also going to have to limit the load to what your quads can do there. Mm -hmm. So that really comes down to like, do you have the capacity to psychologically deal with one using less load and force yourself to maintain this technique in order for this to now be an exercise that is going to bring up the quads and start balancing out your strength in that squat. If not, then I can't accomplish it here. What I need to do is I need to say, okay, no squatting for you. We're going to go and we are going to isolate, increase the strength of your quads and exercises where you don't have the option to, you know, hinge it, mm -hmm. right? So we're going to do more hack squats. We're going to do more leg extensions. We're just going to find ways to make you do that. And there's going to be technique that comes with that too, but it'll just be more manageable. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we go back and try a quad dominant squat again, if all of a sudden you now have more capacity to handle torque around the knee, then all of a sudden this is an easier solution for your body to maintain that kind of more knee dominant squat before it has to go to the hips. So the strength is part of this equation in terms of like how we mechanically do a movement. So, cause for instance, if I, you know, if I cut out your glutes, right. And I put in some really tiny little glutes what you might do is instinctively have to do a quad dominant squat because you just simply can't manage the torque at the hip and vice versa. So I think people tend to look at this stuff as if we are too robotic, right? Like they just, you know, they'll draw stick figures and be like, okay, with this much mass, there's this much torque at the hip, there's this much torque at the knee, or, you know, there's this much load on the system. And in reality, the only way there's any compression, extension, torque, is the muscle action because without the muscle action the joints would just collapse right so i i love the you know the argument that you know some some camps have of like well like they'll do all these torque based arguments of like oh this 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 and this i'm like the only way that any of that stuff is happening is if you have the muscular capability to make that torque because the re resistance causes no torque through any joint right because if the muscle doesn't act the joint just just moves you know with one ounce of resistance and all of a sudden like you know thing you know it's just it's just gonna move right so the only thing that actually results in the torque is the muscle action so strength is a huge portion of how i can mechanically do something as into anything that's multiple joint right and technically even an isolated joint so if we were if we were to look at something as simple as elbow flexion you have multiple elbow flexors they're gonna have different advantages at different portions of that range of motion. But if one of them is very well developed and another one is underdeveloped, at that moment in time, the internal stresses on that joint are more subject to the thing that simply can produce more tension, right? Do you think, so this is actually kind of cool, uh, just because I want to like convince people, but do you think, so like the, a lot of the argument is like I do things this way and like it fucking works for this but you like you know that they have a weak I don't know whatever tricep or quad or further bench or whatever you think working on things as a whole to bring up weak stuff can uh, I guess work out for max strength I know we're kind of jumping from 
bodybuilding the hypertrophy, but like I deal with yeah. a lot of powerlifters. Do you think that they should bring up those weak muscles and like take an ego hit a little bit to then affect the, the top end? Because that's what we see is the struggle. I don't want to stop this because I'll get weaker, but do you think it's possible to get stronger by actually working on that shit? Yeah. So th this is where, like where you look at things in time is very important. So, um, so for instance, if we look at a squat and we look at, well, okay, what are, what are the main parts of the squat from the lower body glutes, the Dr. Mag squat, those kind of like, those are your big three hitters. Okay. If the wink link in any of those, it's likely going to have a huge impact on the total amount of force production. But if it's your quads and you're a really hip dominant squatter, it might not be as much as if it was your hips. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not still going to contribute to that. Cause when we look at a squat, you know, you have the ability to shift throughout that entire range of motion. And you, you know, it's, if your quads can do a little bit more in a certain portion of the range to let your hips just not to have to expend as much energy, you'd be surprised at how much your body can use everything that has available to do this movement. But if we improve isolated strength, it doesn't necessarily immediately transfer. So there's this combination of like, well, we are the sum of our parts, but not directly just like, okay, because if you're doing a hip dominant squat and you have really, really strong quads, they can only help so much. So it's not like there's an infinite like level to which you can bring up your quad strength and your squat is going to go up. What will actually happen is your squat technique may start to shift. Your body's going to use whatever it has. And so that's where it's this combination of taking time where you can bring the parts up in isolation and then go back into, all right, now let's look at just actually doing the power lifting form of like, let's find the position that allows us to move the most load because your nervous system is always solving the immediate problem based off of what's available. So whatever I have in terms of strength now, that's how I'm solving the problem. I can't change the length of my femurs. I can't change the length of my tibias. Um, you know, are there some joints and stuff where maybe I can open up some range of motion and things like that? Sure, but largely we're not gonna change our anthropomorphics or the range of motions that we can go through. But what we can change about this movement pattern is how much, like what are the force generators and how much can they contribute at every inch of the range? And if there's portions where something can contribute significantly more and take off of the other, you're gonna see big, big improvements there. So the answer is yes, but the question is always, but by how much? Yeah. And you have to look at it in the lens that, you know, you still have to put these pieces back together and the nervous system has to then incorporate them and figure out how to use them. I think that that's a way more thoughtful approach. And I actually, I'm glad we actually got to that point. Cause I think if you take everything that you kind of layered out, you have a different type of strategy or solution to this, the same problems, so to speak. And you can, I think you can take that methodology and apply it to more problems as opposed to blanket statementing one squatty squat through that. And I'm not saying that every, like this is where I'll preface this. I don't think all coaches are doing that. I'm just saying if that's the hammer you're using to fix everything i don't know if that's the best way and that's kind of yeah. like that's why i really wanted to bring you on because like your questioning made me question i'm like fuck well, i, I kind of know and like i'm doing it but i didn't actually describe it or figure out a way in which i can process this this has been really helpful for me so i well, appreciate it we, but have, I we have to be honest about this the starting point of this whole conversation was is that dean told ben that he's bigger than him because he deadlifts and, yeah. the, and, and ben we, said <laughs> ben said why don't we have Kasim on to talk about whether or not the deadlift is good for hypertrophy. And, and we don't come out to zero. Mixing plot. <laughs> but I, I think that, that that's, if we like narrowed, it, I think that that conversation may have led down a similar route based on where we sure. were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just that now after reading our emails, there's no fucking way we could do this in an hour. Like I think that, <laughs> yeah. well, that's why I didn't even bring it up because I was like, I think that this will be more helpful in this moment for the people that I know are listening. Actually, the deadlift question is much easier. Like, okay. that's a much easier thing to go through. Um, and, you know, now that we've established all of these yeah. principles, yeah. it wouldn't be that long of a conversation. So, you have 10 minutes? We can always, yeah, we, I have 10 well, minutes. If you, you want, if, let's do you it. 10 minutes. Like, that way we can give everyone everything. So, like, this is the second one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what are your right? thoughts? I don't even want, like, the camps, just like we established everything. What the fuck do you think is the best way to get hypertrophy hamstrings? And is it deadlifts? Yeah. So when we look at a deadlift, well, again, we'll ask the question is like, well, what is a deadlift, right? Because your deadlift is going to have X amount of hip extension and knee extension. 
and somebody else is going to have a different amount. If we're qualifying, a deadlift is picking the load off the floor, right? So what we need to do is break down the components of that and say like, okay, in a deadlift, right, the hamstrings contributing contribution to the lift would be hip extension. They would be they would be hip extensors, right? Obviously, if they did their knee flexion component, then you would sit on the floor, um, and you know, bar would go nowhere, right? You know, we could, you know, reverse action deadlifts, right? Pulling your butt to the floor instead of lifting them. Um, so if a de if we're going to say, is a deadlift good for hamstrings, we have to look at how do we build a deadlift that is going to allow the hamstrings to contribute to hip extension the most, right? And so that's where we get into like, well, okay, an RDL or a straight leg deadlift, eliminates the knee extension component, which is very important because if I have to look at what the body can use in terms of doing a deadlift, right? All right, the quads are going to be the knee extension drivers and the same, there are hip extension muscles are the same as a squat. It's, it's our glutes and, you know, and our adductor magnus are going to be the main drivers. So if I need to be doing knee extension, I can't have hamstring tension being a large contributor to the hip extension because it's going to antagonize the knee extension, right? That would be that that would be a very very stupid solution on my nervous system's part. Okay, so essentially what needs to happen around all these joints is there always needs to be enough stability of co-contraction, but one side needs to be significantly winning to overcome the resistance. So the more the more you have a deadlift that is isolated to hip extension and minimized in terms of knee extension, the more hamstring contribution there can be. And that's, that's, that's the biggest part of the story right there. It's easy. So, yeah. <laughs> After we go through right? all, cause what I think about is like, so the argument, and now that we've kind of defined all these terms, you're right. It's easy. It's like, so for me, no quads, like I'm, I'm, everyone's like, Oh, why do you have such a high hip starting point? It's so, a well, after listening to you, I was like, well, I can't flex my knee very well. Right. So I'm just going to do this thing. But it's the people who are arguing about it, it's good for hamstrings. It's like, Ben, Ben, ben doesn't have a good deadlift. This is where the whole argument started. It's not good for his hamstrings. He has massive quads and no hamstrings. Yeah. So, he, so it makes, it actually makes sense. Then you would just bias it to get less knee flexion. And then his way of getting hamstrings would to just be super high hip. And he's doing it anyway. He's doing, he's doing RDLs, which he's big. Muscle. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, him, that's not the solution. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's really interesting when you look at this, especially if you follow guys that do a lot of isolated hinging, you know, like you, you look at a guy like Jordan Peters, you know, that's got like an, you know, his, you know, adductor magnus is the size of both of my legs put together. Right. Um, and you look at how much they can straight hinge versus how much they can deadlift. And there are guys based off their anthropomorphics and the fact that if the knee doesn't have to extend, the hamstring can, can, do more they'll actually rdl more than they could pull off the floor yeah right but if you look at guys that have the ability to really use their quads in a deadlift then it'll be the opposite they'll be able to you know so the other thing with this and i kind of got into this um i made a really cool little thing with a pen in uh, ben's video but yeah. it does come down to that at certain lows and you know under certain conditions you can do a, you know, a biarticular or a two joints um, movement where you get isolation movement at one joint. Um, and then the reality is this is stuff is happening, you know, to the nanosecond. And we're a lot of times just looking at it. Oh, it's just one movement happen. But in reality, it's like there's a few milliseconds where your knee is not moving and your hip is moving more. And we, but it looks like it's one concerted movement to us. Um, and then the eccentric is often very different too. So if you look at how people tend to lower a deadlift, well, you may have somebody that uses a little bit of everything coming up, but then they initiate that movement with just like a straight hinge. And then the knee movement is just the bottom. So you could say like, well, technically for about three fourths of this movement, the hamstrings are able to, you know, really function as hip extensors. And then at a certain point, you don't really get to use them anymore. And a lot of times that's where you will see, um, where people either have sticking points or they their form breaks or whatnot or in these transitional spots where all of a sudden they lose the ability to use either the hamstrings or the rec femme um, because you have the opposing movement at the other joint. 
So personal question, but I think that this is actually, so Ben's main point, and like, I think everyone's main point is like, it fucking, my, I feel my back. How do they eliminate back? No, no, like just in isolation, like what's the best way to eliminate back and feel even the other two things? And if someone feels it, because I think that that gets to be the main argument of why they can't feel happy, not even necessarily the quads. Yeah. Um, well, here's the problem. If we're going to load the pelvis by, you know, putting torque on that in an anterior rotation, um, really, you just have to have enough back strength. That's yeah. that's the main thing because because I mean you have to look at this too as like a, this is this is gets complicated with the spine because it's like okay, a lighter load further away from the spine is less load, but it, there's more things needed to transfer that torque to the hip um, versus, well, okay, if we were to move the load closer to the hip, but now we got to put a shitload of load in that one spot. So there's kind of pros and cons to each, and it really depends on what happens to be your current weakness in terms of trunk stability, spinal stability, right? Like most people think that the we only have just like these two erectors that are just the lumbar, but no, we got erectors that run like all the way up uh, our spine. Um, so in that case, I would say, you know, general solution is just strengthen the back and actually learn how to get yourself into mechanically favorable positions so that they're less likely to be the limiting factor. Um, and in the short term, use things like a pre-exhaust or post-exhaust, something to basically lower the load threshold that you need to be able to do that, right? So if I, if I can you know, pre-fatigue the hamstrings as knee flexors, then they're more likely to be the limiting factor in, in RDL because, you know, and I, I won't have to use as much load. So now fresh erectors, pre-fatigue, you know, there is going to be some consequences of like, well, now the glutes and maybe the adductor magnus are a little bit better solutions, but at least it's not back. Yeah. Um, you know. Well, I think that that's a good way. I think, yeah, I don't know what. I'm gonna, I was going to, I want to make a reference point because uh, this brings me back to a, a conversation I think you had with Mike Israel on, I don't know if it's maybe revived stronger, but you talked a lot about pre-exhaust. And I remember that was a big kind of light bulb moment for me in a lot of these exercises. Like the real reason why pre-exhaust is an advantage is what you're just saying here is this is by making that the actual limiting factor the exercise you're trying to target which is yeah i mean yeah there's there's so many there's so many ways to use these training tools right it's just i think i think people get stuck um in a with a very limited mindset um because it's like well this hasn't proved to be superior in the, this applied study and i'm like yeah but right now from a practical application does it help you achieve this goal um, and because, I mean, we're going to need about a billion more applied studies to cover, to cover all of those things of like, well, okay, you know, when, when, when could I use this? When could I use that? When could I flip these orders? Um, and that's where I really like, you know, this principle based approach because we need to be able to solve problems. And then, and a lot of times there's not a black and white answer out there for us to just pull that from, or it's, you know, we get into the null hypothesis of like, well, it doesn't matter except when it does <laughs> well and you just <laughs> right? yeah, even even that last point like and then you layer pre-exhaust you can take that concept like principle based and apply it to the squatty squat and 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 pr the shit out of it and it would still yeah. would then maybe do that thing so i actually like i i like that we didn't have a direct answer we kind of did um you kind of biased it but i think that that is enough principles to like now do whatever the fuck you want to do <laughs> but you heard it here just yeah but just by <laughs> principles you know yeah. i think that's such a great concept for coaching in general well because they take one principle and i think that you're talking about multiple principles and then using your yeah. brain to problem solve yeah you want to i mean and this this is you know if we tie back to the very beginning of our very first conversation which was you saying like yeah there's all these camps and they all have the you know all the three letter camps um we're actually we're working on a system and I was thinking we should just call it the three letter system. Yeah. Like just, right? just like, <laughs> what is it? It's the three letter system, right? <laughs> um, but the, I think, you know, w when you learn something like you need that system and it, you, it needs to kind of be, you know, it needs to be kind of constrained so that you're somewhat proficient in it before you have experience. I think the problem is people never leave that place. And then they become dogmatic in that place. And in reality, it's like, no, 
in in science and, and in all of these things, we there's so many half truths that you learn, you know, when you're learning, you know, everything from like physiology to chemistry, or whatever. Like you never like walk in and then we just we're human beings. We can't just download the entirety of information and instantly process it. So we're always we're always functioning with a, a certain limited amount of that information. And I don't think it's fair to say that like, well, yeah, all of these programs and all of their methods, you know, are bad or blah, or even the too dogmatic. Cause you know, this is where the art of teaching and educating comes in. And this is the thing that I struggle with the most of is like, how do I give somebody, uh, how do I inform them? But I inform them in a way that leaves them with the confidence to be able to go and apply these things, mm -hmm. but not the paralysis by the, like, I, I hate when people leave a course and be like, oh, I learned that I don't know. Like, there's so much I don't know. And if, if and I'm like, well, if that's the only thing you've learned, you're <laughs> fucked now. Because that's what I see that all the time. I'm like, I was a course junkie, and that's what would happen is like, I'd go to a course, and then all of a sudden I'd be flooded with like, you know, Facebook messages or whatever, because it's Facebook back then. Um, and people are like, oh, like, now I tried this thing and it didn't work, and I don't know what to do. And I'm like, you know, and they're like, just all the, they got all this stuff going through their mind and like that's why some of these systems um have to be really you know they have to be taught a little bit more absolute or whatnot they're trying you know yeah. they're trying to find that balance of like how do i let somebody leave and responsibly use this tool but i also need to give that message of like look i've i've put training wheels on this so that when you go out and you use it first that you, you don't crash okay but at some point in time you have to take those training wheels off and you have to, you know, try different things out. And, you know, for anybody that's, that they've come from one of these systems, that's what I would say is look at yourself, look at how you're thinking, look at like the information that you've learned and start to contextualize it more and try and make it be a tool in your toolbox and not be the one way that you do things or approach things. Well, and that's why we wanted to bring you on. And a lot of the infancy of the evolution of what we've been doing is to like bring people on to kind of get how you got from point A to point B to now you're creating ideas and you're educating and all these things. But that whole message that, that lasts like two minutes was essentially if you, informed by the conversation we had makes a lot more sense. And I think that if anyone takes anything away from it, yeah, like the problem solving, the squatty squat, blah, 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 blah. But you can take that ideology or ideal, like that's, that's a bad way of putting it. You can be in the camp of understanding all the camps and make your own camp if you want to. You don't have to. You can stay right. PRI if you want to. It's just mm -hmm. like, that's, that sucks. Yeah. It would suck to be in one thing your whole life. Yeah. I mean, we all get put in boxes, you know, like when just earlier, you know, Jeb's is like, oh, yeah, I thought you were the hypertrophy guy. And I wanted to interrupt him and be like, you know, thanks for thanks for just, you know, putting me in this little box. Right. You know, <laughs> you know, you know what? You're, the, you're the biomechanics right? guy. We'll just. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. See, like for me, for me, who's not super like, you know, informed on it, like I look and I see the conversations you have, the people you're having conversations with. And I say, oh, OK, like to me, this is like bodybuilding hypertrophy like this is that kind of because there's this like weird like bodybuilding hypertrophy camp that started to grow that's like evidence-based and informed and like much more because i'm used to the broy bodybuilding camp and to see this new thing kind of coming out like it's it's cool but yeah it's real easy to make that a whole camp yeah. even and though it's you like comic. not you like comics like bodybuilders don't like comics I think they yeah. do. Like you were already okay. out of the box the second I saw the picture. I was like, oh, and then you put them. I'm like, okay. This isn't, guy... isn't Bane like the ultimate bodybuilder comic though? Yeah. yeah like, so you, you, know what? you kind of are out of box. Yeah. <laughs> hey, take it back. You're in the box yeah, again. Look at the picture of the wall. Let's yeah. explain your box right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like yeah. the picture of uh, oh, from Predator except with Bane and Venom. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. The end. This is that. Is that about like the antiheroes battling over the best antihero? So well, I mean, and then Marvel versus that D would like say like because DC is a lot about antiheroes and and Marvel that's yeah. their one antihero. I guess am they I able to, to am I yeah. able to yeah. bring this closer yeah. without yeah. getting yeah, yeah, yeah. sued by Marvel and DC or whatever it is? Yeah. So I mean, so this is the basic like I, I had this custom um, I had this custom printed. But oh, when we look at Bane, better. right? Like Bane is like he's like that analytical, like 
he's pursuing the science and like injecting the substance, the venom into him constantly. Oh, right. So it's kind of like that. This is the mad scientist version of the meathead. Right. And this is this kind of like that. Well, I just have this like alter ego, that thing that's inside of me that it just comes out and like, Ugh. so it's kind of like the two aspects of like, all right, this is what I'm trying to like investigate from the scientific world and like, like, just inject into my system and see what happens and then this is kind of more of like the psychological the raw side of just like let it just letting whatever's in me just come out that's and express ronnie. itself the, that's yeah. the, beha though. the behavior yeah, is that's, that's ronnie coleman that's ronnie and who yeah. that, that would be uh fuck it, what's this, the, be the behaviors to me is like this is mindfulness at its core That'd it's be the buddy. emotional mind and the logical mind bring them yeah. together and you have the it's, wise it's, mind it's ronnie and, yeah. and buddy it's um it's Pukowski. Pukolski? Pukolski. That's Venom. Yeah, there you or, go. Sorry, that's Bane. Like, you guys Bane's are... Pukolski. Yeah. And like, yeah. yeah I, maybe you might not like that. Yeah. I, I, we'll, we'll put, I just won't <laughs> make any comments on that. Yeah. He'd be a lot smaller. A lot, lot smaller. Like, maybe that's the... Maybe that's the one with Arnold, you know, that they did that Batman version where it was just like the, we'll put it this way. When you talk about like, well, he's this corrupt prisoner or whatever, then yeah, then I would, I would agree with you there, but we, mad scientist, uh, not so much. I, I love the way into that. Thanks, thanks for coming out and taking your time. I know, I know we yeah. got to this point, but it was good because I think, I'm glad we didn't talk about anything we talked about, but we kind of did. <laughs> yeah. So where where where, oh, yeah. where should we send people yeah if they want to find you your education stuff like instagram like what's the best way to find you and your products yeah i mean so i think most people are on instagram right now so you can look uh i'm just coach underscore castle which is you know probably too hard to pronounce so if you go to our uh business page it's just at n1 dot education that's also our website or whatnot but you can look in the like, you know, we got one of those link things in all the bios that'll basically take you to everywhere that you want to go. Um, if you're interested in like, just, you just, you don't want to learn all the courses and become an expert in this. You just want to see how we do shit. Like in terms of how we perform exercises, we have a membership base and it's just at n1.training. Um, and that's got an exercise library you can subscribe. So that's basically our lower level information. And then if you really want to dig deep, then we have courses on uh, at and one dot education. If you follow me, just understand that you're going to get a little of me. So if you didn't like my personality in this podcast, just then just stick to the other stuff. <laughs> no, I think this is so sick because, um, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I think you presented things in a way that, um, I definitely want to pursue more of the, the education offerings you have now, because I think the way you presented it spoke a lot to, uh, both the higher level people and, and people, like me or more peasants low <laughs> peasants he won't say it though we'll say it for you <laughs> yeah. i mean everybody everybody has a place to contribute in this industry right there's people on the front lines there's people in the lab um and i think the the more that we communicate the, and the less we put each other in boxes and be like no you stay over there i think just the better it is for all or we of can us. just have them fight and have an arm wrestle yeah, I, that's actually my goal. Like, you know, they got Thor and uh, Eddie are both going to make like seven figures. Oh, so man. it's like, man, I just need to get my following up high enough. And then all the people I disagree with, I can just call out and, you know, make money fighting them. That's the long term solutions right there. Can you imagine that? I just, I actually miss fighting so much since lockdown because I, I, that's my, that's my hobby. So I'm like, just, I just start challenging people on the internet if we can socially. Get close yeah. enough to fight. Well, isn't that awesome. how like they start to fuck? We're gonna go on forever. Okay, I'm gonna end, <laughs> I'm gonna end this thing and then end we it. Can talk after. Okay, take it easy, guys. That's right. I have wrestled with an alligator. I don't tussle with a whale. I don't handcuff lightning. Throw thunder in jail. You can't stop me. I'm going to win. It ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. I won't quit. I just keep getting stronger. 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 stronger.